I'm honored to introduce this Braun 100 talk series. My name is Jana Scholze. I'm a design historian here in London and an associate professor at the Kingston School of Art. This series of talks is meant as a start of a new dialogue. The designer James Bridle talks about the new dark age and refers to an overwhelming amount of information that comes towards us every single day. At the same time, it is met by a simplicity of narratives that deal with complex and complicated situations and conditions met by post-factual politics. We feel that this kind of situation needs a kind of slowing down. It needs talking to people that we probably haven't heard before. It needs listening. And in this respect, we start probably the series with doubt. We start doubting what we have thought before. We start doubting the kind of narratives that are established, that we felt so secure about. In terms like simple, useful, built to last, might have a very different definition at the end of this series. This is definitely something we wish for. I'm very pleased to announce the first talk in the series, which is part of the Global Design Forum of this year's London Design Festival. It will be a discussion between the designer Ilse Crawford, Benjamin Hubbard, and the historian Peter Kappos on good design for a better future. I'm Peter Kapos, I'm a design historian, and today I'm going to be in conversation with designers Benjamin Hubert and Ilsa Crawford. The subject of today's talk is going to be Good Design for a Better Future, which will be the first of what I hope will be a long series of forthcoming Braun talks. Uh, the talk is part of the London Design Festival and also part of the celebrations of Braun's own centenary which will be happening in 2021. So I'm, I've been giving the, the, um, the subject of today's talk a little bit of, a bit of thought. Um, and this topic, good design for a better future, um, when I first heard this, the, this, this title, it sort of struck me, well, there's something slightly historical about it. Um, and I think, you know, reflecting on it, Maybe, maybe one of the reasons for that is that for really for a long time, design hasn't really been oriented towards the future. It's maybe been oriented towards markets, but not the future. And that, that's sort of the idea of design, that the purpose and aim of design is to create a better future feels very early 20th century. You know, maybe it sort of stopped around the 1960s. And since then, something else has happened. You know, design maybe has got absorbed within other, other projects, other processes. So, well, you know, why now does it feel, again, that this isn't just a kind of rhetorical, sort of historical posture, but it kind of feels like, yeah, actually, that's, that's a good question to ask. I mean, I think you could argue that the sort of ABC of design, if you like, the sort of Alto, Bauhaus, Conrad School of Design came out of two world wars. You know, mm -hmm. and I think they were really looking to rebuild and um, create this better world, this better future, this more equitable future that rejected, you know, the disease and the aristocratic um, hierarchies of the 19th century, post-industrial, mm -hmm. if you like. And I guess there's never been a, uh, a more palpable time than, than uh, geographically, at least where we are, where there's been such a, you know, a force for change. Absolutely, and we're right in that place again, aren't we? We've mm -hmm. got the pandemic, we've got the tremendous pressure of, you know, climate change and the climate emergency, and of course, the realization of just the terrific social, economic, and racial inequalities. So mm -hmm. we're faced with actually quite similar but different challenges. Mm -hmm. And design is good in the face, I think, of adversity. And I think in a way that's even this, it might sound a little bit 
thin, but it's, it, I think of it like a toolkit. It's, it's like a, a, a set of tools at the moment to how do you combine these things and how do you um, use them as a, as a driver to, to question what is next and, and, and why are you creating more things? And I, you know, we've talked a lot over the last few weeks and uh, something I think is, is important to talk about maybe is also the history of, of Brown mm. and how, as, as a younger designer and I look back at that era and obviously not being around when Dieter Rams and, and that cohort were driving an, a, such a big agenda through, through the platform of Braun. Mm. Um, I, 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 look at the, I look at it stylistically, so I look at it a little bit around um, minimalism. You know, most people would consider Brown to be, to be minimalism. Mm. Um, I actually think about it a bit more as essentialism and tapping into what Ilsa said and connecting it to Brown, the, I think the idea at the moment is, is you know, what is essential? What do we really need? And, and how can we take the values of Brown, which are broadly thought of as minimalism, but I think that's too one-dimensional. Mm. And how do we start a conversation around essentialism? Yeah, I think I mean, that's, that's, that's really yeah. interesting. And it, I think just I mean, connecting that, that thought with something that, that, that I also referred to in relation to the war and design projects that respond to really quite serious crises. And I think what we're going through at the moment, even if it's only at an economic level, which is quite a high level of abstraction, has been compared to a war in terms of its, its, its cost and its, you know, its, its destruction. So maybe that's an interesting thing to think about. If we're in a situation which is um, like, a, like a, a world war, mm. it requires some kind of a new beginning. And in that case, maybe there are historical practices or historical models which can be repurposed for this situation. But you don't do it on your own. And I think, you know, you need partners, and obviously Braun was a great mm. client mm. Uh, uh, for design, you know, had vision. Um, you had a political context which was mm. arguably more progressive at the time, more mm. open, not universally, but, you know, and I think the climate that we're in right now, there are definitely clients who are more progressive, more open, and obviously this climate context of that yeah. is critical, but I think it's by no means as open as it should be. Although, interestingly, I was talking to a guy who had been um, at Goldman Sachs, quite high up at Goldman Sachs, um, and he said he thought that actually in the next couple of years there was what going to be what he called um, the inevitable policy response because he said most governments are nowhere near hitting their Paris Agreement target. So he thinks there's gonna be a dramatic shift in government and corporate and indeed financial markets in a couple of years time in order to address that. So I think that's an opportunity mm. that we should be prepared for. Mm. I wonder who will engage in that though. I wonder who are the, you know, like you said, it's a, it's a team you have to put together. The design is in, in isolation is intellectually interesting, but uh, in practice doesn't go anywhere. No, that's what I'm saying. You need government, you need systemic change, you need companies, you need yeah. individuals, you need yeah. everybody to come together to push for this better future. Yeah. You can't do it on your own. And there's the necessity of the situation itself doesn't bring about the change because, mm. I mean, well, the recent history of, of responses to the demand for change has been very, very slight, despite all the predictions. I mean, one, one thing I think is encouraging is that whether this is just a label, um, but you know, the startup climate of new businesses and new ideas mm. and new risk, I think is, is, is the world we live in. Whereas I'm not sure you would, you would say the same things you know, 50 years ago. Mm. I think there's, there's, a, there's an energy around starting um, new agendas of thinking, producing new types of products, and, and it being commercially successful. And I think this, this, what's also interesting as a designer at the moment is that, you know, we're lucky enough to work with some really big um, kind of blue chip type companies, but the ones that are really driving the, the super interesting projects where they they take risk in their stride are the smaller, more nimble companies at the moment. And 
and I, I think it's, a, it's an amazing landscape of thinkers right now, and it just yeah. needs a little bit more backing in the right yeah. places to accelerate that. And I think, and I think that creates a new context because we're also lucky enough to have some more established clients, older clients, but they are influenced by the younger ones. Yeah. So actually, but they're by no means the majority of the clients out there, I suspect, but there are you know, people in their 50s who mm. want to make a difference, who want to use their means to really make a difference mm. and who are progressive. Mm. And I think that's a context, as you rightly point out, that's you know, in part set by all of this amazing variety, diversity of thinking, and of course, tech, which means mm. those ideas spread very fast, which mm. is something that was very different. So if, if, I had an anecdotal conversation with, um, maybe I shouldn't say this, but with a, with a VC um, around, they, they had an agenda to back new initiatives that would somehow make the world a better place and the future a better place um, through this period and to tackle some of this period directly. Mm. And they said to me that they had hundreds of thousands of applicants for this fund. Quite a big fund, not the world's biggest fund, but they didn't back any of them. Mm. Because what they found was that everyone was trying to do what, you know, design takes time. And everyone was trying to truncate that time from what is normally years, whether it's mm -hmm. an interior, whether it's an, a, a, an object, into a matter of months. And it became, the failure became inevitable with nearly everything they looked at. And I, I wonder how we balance the necessity of time to make significant change with the need to do it quicker. Yeah. Well. I mean, there are some really good examples. Um, there's a nursing program in the Netherlands. I talk about the Netherlands quite a lot because I taught there for a long time, but I'm also quite a fan of its way of governance. And um, there, there's a guy who set up a new approach to nursing. And his approach was based on creating these clusters of nurses who would be completely responsible for their money and mm -hmm. so on and so on. And his take is that, in fact, you don't necessarily make newness or progress by being new. Mm. Actually, what's interesting is if you strip away all the sort of bureaucracy and you know, the waste of time stuff and give res take, push responsibility down to the people who are making the decisions on the ground. Mm. And that, that's what, you know, it's organizational um, approaches that actually can be very new and trust is very new because mm. we have lived in a controlling society where everything is, you know, um, de-risked. Mm. Whereas actually, you can argue that trust will make for a new society mm. and trusting people to make the right decisions on the ground. And those are tested, mm. you know, it, we don't have to invent everything. Mm. I, I, I completely agree. I, I, I think that you, you keep most things the same and you change one ingredient. And it's, and it's almost revolution just by doing that. Mm. Um, and I, and I, we, we tend to think about it in the way that um, if you've got a bunch of levers in front of you on a design project and you pull them all down because that's mm. really progressive, it's going it's yeah, to yeah. change the future, nobody gets it. Nobody understands it. It yeah. doesn't integrate with anyone's life. You just need to pull one of them down and tweak a few others and suddenly you've got something that is evolutionary enough but tackles enough of the problems but it's also consumable. Mm. Because actually a lot of the things that we think were invented in, under the umbrella of modernism had actually been invented in the 1870s, 1880s, mm. but they were given a visual language mm. in modernism. So I think, yes, it's not about everything being new, but it is about it being appropriate and resilient and relevant mm. and you know, addressing those, the issue that we have right things, now. Uh, might become part of... Uh, um, kind of a general criteria for a redefinition of good. Mm. And that's, of course, the other thing, you know, circling back what is good and mm. what is better, because I think yeah. going back to the examples that we talked about earlier, I'm, I'm afraid they are still that sort of white, pale, male vision of what is good and what is better. And we are in a very different century, thank mm. goodness. And so, therefore, the definition of that has to be something that comes from somewhere else. Mm. I'm kind of also interested in the idea of what is the um, MVP of solving things at the moment to make that better future. So what is the minimum viable product? 
And that might not be the, the very best version of it, that is the most refined and elegant execution of it, mm. but it might solve the problem the best in the shortest amount of time. And we're seeing it right now. So exactly. you know, all the PPE that's out there, you know, we would look at this and go, well, that's not very resolved mm -hmm. and this needs to be improved. But actually, how many lives is it? Functionally, solving? does it actually do the job? Yeah. And the next stage, you know, as I was saying earlier, can happen yeah. later. But first of all, we have to make it fit for purpose. Yeah. You know, people are looking now at, um, instead of a normal cycle of 12 to 18 months to do maybe something with, with, with tech inside it and, and quite consumer driven to tackle some kind of need, so not just arbitrary nice things. Um, they're now looking at sort of this three to six month cycle um, and a lot of it is actually, you know, design has become about sourcing, finding the right people and amalgamating some things that have come before to make the better version of it. Mm. And, and it's a question more than a, more than a definitive statement as to whether that's better. But I wonder what, how sustainable that is from how many times you need to keep doing that in order well, to keep solving. I mean, science is, that's the definition of science. They stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm. It's quite rare that science actually comes out of nowhere. It's normally based on a sequence of um, individuals' research, building, 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 and then serendipity. Apparently 50% of science actually comes from serendipitous mm. discoveries. So I think the notion that design is always, I mean, A, new and B, linear, mm. is, you know, mm. obviously we need innovation, of course, if that's, but to your earlier point, where does that come from? Mm. So much of the things that are probably appropriate to our issues right now are maybe solutions from 2,000 years ago or from indigenous people. You know, they're probably not from yesterday, hmm. but they're certainly many of the solutions have probably hmm. been done before. I mean, you know, sustainability is not just about stuff, it's also about knowledge. Hmm. Ilse, you, ma you mentioned this sort of this sort of speculation that there may shortly be some kind of a, a dramatic transition in terms of the kind of the legal regulatory framework within which manufacturers operate. Hmm. That might change, produce new conditions for design. I'm just wondering, before that, mm. what uh, you know? Have you found that that clients are are, are changing? Are they are clients responding to? Mm. Well, there's a lovely Dutch. Or are you there's a lovely with... Dutch word which is forward thinking, one step back, which mm. probably encapsulates the situation we're in right now. But I do think that there is an understanding that the system that we're in doesn't work. Mm and that we, yeah, that it's going to be messy, basically, before we can really move forward. Mm. Mm. People are more open, people are more open, for sure. But, you know, equally, we are in business right now, so, you know, they're also anxious about that, I mean, you know, collectively speaking. But we know, we know we're at this massive turning point. Yeah. I mean, we all know it. Right. Mm. So I think that in and of itself is Just an opportunity. It, it seems that there would be a kind of like an obvious tension between what, what we can all agree on now as being you know, what's, what's required and what's necessary and what a client's requirements oh, yeah. might be. Mm. And if that, well, what they want and yeah. what they... I mean, I think... So does it need to be a choice or, a, or is, there a, is there a way that somehow both parties can be satisfied and we can feel that the better future is still... I mean, there's got to be a push the, and a pull. Yes. Right, so there's got to be uh, an institutional, governmental and, and systemic push to, to Absolutely. change. Absolutely. Yeah. But people have got to pull it and want it as well. And uh, some people have more courage than others, yeah. put simply. Some, you know, and courage comes from heart. Mm. You know, some people are driven by the numbers, by the Excel sheet, by the need for certainty. And others are like, you know, what the heck, I'm going to do it. Mm. And, and that's just yeah. what it takes to make a break for it, isn't it? And we talked about sustainability a second ago, I, mm. that, and that push-pull thing. Like this, and this might sound terrible, but in my experience, when you introduce sustainability fundamentally to any, um, mostly a physical offering, it often gets more expensive mm. because it often uses new processes. It um, uh, you know, deals with waste in a different mm. way, and you've got to bake all of these things into you know, cost point and then yeah. price point. Yeah. So it's a longer term strategy yeah, by definition, really you know, because everything that you just mentioned is because we're at the end of something, which is obviously where the 
basic costs are optimized. You know, you yeah. know your systems, you've got, deli you've got your distribution, it's all set up. So all of that has to be redone. But it is the end. I mean, there's nobody who doesn't know that. Mm. So, yeah, I think we are going to go through difficult times. And to your point, systemic change. I was reading the other day about one of the things that kick-started fast fashion. Mm. And it was some very sexy sounding um, law called the Multi-Fibers Agreement. <laughs> I mean, have we all heard of that? Well, no. <laughs> Apparently, it expired in 2005. And almost immediately, all those controls over international textile imports mm. gone. And that's when we had that avalanche of, you know, questionable textiles coming in from China. Yeah. That's what created the whole textile industry in Bangladesh. But, you know, that's because that law disappeared. Yeah. We need laws. I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about things like skin care, which is something that I'm really interested in personally. Mm. And, you know, the EU controlled the um, toxic chemicals going into skin care products. I believe there's something like 2,000-ish um, chemicals that are forbidden to go into skincare mm. products under the EU agreements. In the US, there's 11. I mean, mm. you know, these are the things yeah. that then seep into our bodies, that seep into the water system. Yeah. We need controls I, for I, a better I, future. I find this idea of, like, of, a, of a renewed and more robust regulatory framework recreating the conditions of 1950s and 1960s design again kind of kind of interesting. I mean, I would say... I mean, what, what, would the, what would the principles be now of, of good design given, like, ideal conditions? If that regulatory framework were there mm -hmm. to allow it or to, you know, to make it, to make it a requirement, what, what, what would it be? What would be the, the kind of the, the principles of, of something like good design? Or? I mean, we're talking a lot about this push model of, you know, government and coming top-down top change and and, 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 and that's, that's a system that will, will create change. I, th I actually I think it's completely opposite. Mm. I think there's a generation now that has reprioritized mm. um, what they value in anything they buy into. So, yes. you know, if we, we do a lot of work with, you know, put a label on it, Gen Z, and you look at how they think about product, you look, about, you yep. look at how they yep. think about where it's from, who's making it, uh, around diversity, uh, around mm. sexuality, all of these types of things have created mm. a totally yep, new completely. playing field. Yeah. I agree completely. It's not about top-down change, but you need regulations to enforce transparency and accountability. Mm -hmm. Because without that, we can care as much as we like, but if we have no idea what's going on, it's very difficult. Uh, yeah, I, and I think it's all about what's the accelerant. So what's mm. the catalyst to make that happen sooner or later? Absolutely. And if you see the protests and you see everyone that's now having a voice, because social media has given everyone a voice, Everyone has almost become equal, right? And you can build your audience, and you can build a huge audience. You don't necessarily need to be a traditional, uh, somebody traditionally famous. Mm. And that has suddenly put the, uh, these agendas in the spotlight. And I think that's why they're being discussed in Parliament and, Absolutely. and, and places like that. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you know, we are the system. We have the power. We can hold government accountable. We just have to make the effort to do so and know that we have that power. Mm -hmm. And also, to be honest, have the facility to engage in it. It's and we need to know the truth as well, because I think, you know, it's all very well fighting for the truth. I think Margaret Atwood said recently, you know, but it has to be the truth. Mm. Yeah. Ilsa, earlier you were talking about uh, sort of the possibility of the development of different, different um, sort of forms of consumption, or maybe, maybe ones that aren't so tied to ownership. Mm. Like the generation rent and the rental economy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and the future life of things. You mm. know, you have to have things, but you know, as Zita Cobb says, the problem with consumerism is that we don't love things and we mm. need to make things that people love more. And that means that you take care of them, mm. that you repair them, that mm. there is a repair culture. I mean, try and get something repaired today. It's really hard. Um, mm. Electricals, as we discussed before, mm. are almost impossible. Um, you know, and then, if it does go on and have another life, whether it's rented or resold, it is still something that has value. I mean, that's very hard to imagine in terms of most of the things that we have today. I mean, would you be able to resell your printer? Probably not. Yeah. Mm. And I think what's interesting about that is going, is, is new the currency? Or, and new shouldn't be the currency. I, I always laugh when I um, 
So if, if we're uh, launching something or exhibiting something, particularly you know, during Milan Design Week, mm. you get this phrase called novelties. What are the new novelties yeah. this year? Yeah, yeah. And I can't think of a worse word. <laughs> it's a terrible word, isn't it? New is not a, you know, it's, yeah. it's in and of itself, apparently, something to justify making things, which is nuts. Mm. It doesn't describe anything. Mm. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're right. Like, you know, and, and so therefore the, the quality of how something ages, the patina mm. it might develop, mm. the, the way it's built and constructed, you know, how does that become front page news? Yeah. Yeah. Not the colour that's been flashed on it or the pattern yeah. that's yeah. on top of it. Also, we've, it's, we've it's identified true. new as better, but there's absolutely no correlation because yeah. there's no reason why new is necessarily better. Better yeah. is just better. Yeah. They're, not, they're not the same on any level. Mm. This is this kind of... Uh, the, the marketing cliche of new, new and improved, which remains fixed. It's always new and improved. Mm. Whereas I, I guess if you're thinking as a consumer more about, less about owning something and maybe using it as part of a kind of, you know, self-presentation status, whatever, and thinking about it more in terms of use, it becomes a different, you have a different relation to the object. But Ilse is right, I think the, the, you need a system in place in order to maintain, and, and you, everything needs improvement, but improvement can be um, th thought about in different ways, but you know, I, if, if I throw out a product, it's because I, there's no feasible way for me to really upgrade it, update it, clean it, um, rebuild it, because you know, this system doesn't exist. Mm. Yeah, no, completely, it's, it's nuts. You know, we have some lights that we designed for um, a Swedish manufacturer of Asperg, but to get them repaired, we have to send them to Sweden. Yeah. It's completely yeah. crazy. You know, and also, you know, there's this endless discussion around you know, how we're living longer, pension age is now pushing out into eternity, 66, but probably 67 before we know it. So what are people supposed to be doing? I mean, I'm not suggesting that you know, the only thing you want to do is repair things in your older age, but come on. I mean, we need to also create businesses that people can run from home, that are more low key, that, yeah, we need to think about jobs that are not simply for the Logan's run generation and then shoved over the edge of a cliff at the end of it. And I think it's one thing that's um, part of that is how do you make something, a thing, appreciate and not depreciate? Mm. And we were talking about, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was talking to Peter about trying to get hold of some um, uh, Dieter Rams uh, brown uh, equipment. Mm. And it's appreciated like crazy. Mm. And, and the value in that traditional Absolutely. consumer electronics is, is depreciates like a car. Yeah, right? As exactly. soon as you buy it, it's 50%. It's a really interesting one, this. I mean, this is where I think it gets really interesting. Is how can you make design that actually, every time it changes hands, has more value. Yeah. How can you do that? Because I think that's so much more interesting than new. Yeah, it really is. And I think that's the, that, you know, that timeless value is one of the things that run, is, is that red thread that has run through Brown. And the reason yeah. why we're in this room relating to that brand is, is because of that timeless quality. And it, but, yeah, timeless but it's, is the rubber stamp for the most amount of sustainable you can have on a, on a product or something. Mm. But, I think it's like but we get back to the issue that for <laughs> many people, not within the design world, I hope, but outside, they tend to look at design as an aesthetic thing. Yeah, so yeah. when they Seems come good. to you, and I'm sure they must, I bet they come to you saying, please design me something timeless like. Yeah. Mm. You know, and of course, there's, I mean, timeless like is not mm. remotely again. It's also like a correlation. It's got to be, um, you've got to start with it, but it's, it's, it's a formula which you can't just replicate from some, how something else did. Yeah. You have to yeah, build yeah. your own set of values. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's the inherent problem that, you know, it's like iconic. What is iconic? Yeah. Okay, no, just I mean an iconic. Yeah, I mean, uh. yeah. I mean, it's, you, you, you can't do yeah. it. Icons yeah. earn their, their, their place and the right to be called iconic after what? What are we going to say? 20 years at least? Well, and also that's other people's perception and True. not to mention cultural context. I mean, yeah. who could have known that some of the materials that have come through and values that have come through yeah. would have come through exactly in the combination that they have today. It depends on where you are on the mountain. The timeless is a kind of an unnecessarily kind of theological category to talk about objects in. You could just say still relevant. Yeah, you know, absolutely. For, for, a, for a product which you, know, you would consider to be super successful if it's remained in production for 10 years. The only thing that I think- To be still relevant after 50 or 60 years, the only thing I think is relevant to your point about relevance, I think, 
is that um, there is a universal truth that is the per that the personal is universal. Mm. So the truer it is to just the simple human need, the more likely it is, I think, mm. to be to last. I think a lot of the time today we are trying to think about these big equations mm, and, yeah. you know, how can we meet the needs of all these different groups and all these different... And what we forget is actually that fundamentally we are inwardly yeah. thinking, feeling beings. Yeah. And that's the thing that's universal. If something's like, if, you know, a, a, a good design which maybe does something formally, articulates something which is just a ni just does it nicely, there's an elegance and a lightness to it, mm. and that pleases, and then it performs well, it functions, it serves a purpose and continues to do that, and it's robust. I mean, th that order is definitely different, I, in my opinion. I think, you know, I think the functioning and doing mm. the thing and performing really well sure. is the core of that. Because yeah. style changes, style is personal. Yeah, yeah. You know, who cares about style in a way, right? Yeah. Mm. People have to enjoy it and they have to, have to make them happy, which I think is a better way of maybe framing Absolutely. That. But, yeah. you know, I, I like to think about high-performance objects being, or high-performance anything being better than what came before. Um, that, that's, that's the benchmark, improving somebody's quality of life yeah. and hopefully making them healthier and happier. Yeah. And I think that's sort of the criteria. But that, those, those things make, well, in whatever order they appear in, make something good. They, they add up to something which, is, as an object, is is good it's sort of it's 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 well suited to its purpose and that it's not maybe like thinking back to some things that were made in the in the 60s and continue to be impressive it's because they've hit those mm. hit those points that, yeah it's that the remains. effect and affect it has yeah. the style is right something that often happens as a consequence of those decisions and mm. it's often something that other people almost impose on you because mm. of the combination of those decisions. Um. You, know, you know, one of the other things which is always interesting in these conversations is talking about, so I sort of just, you know, pushed away style, but unless you make something desirable mm. and yeah. for a really horrible word, beautiful, you know, what is, what is beauty to the eye of the beholder, then it just misses, it, 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 yeah. it never gets that human, um, almost animal attraction to a thing, and therefore that you don't value it. But do, do you find but, that you're, as designers, fighting with that with clients who start with style as the... I mean, the vocabulary is so loaded, isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, I do think that the beauty word is quite an interesting word. I mean, right now, it's obviously one that people feel quite uncomfortable about. Yeah. But, um, for example, in Bermondsey in the early 20s, there was something called the Beautification Committee, which mm -hmm. was a local council <laughs> thing, which was there really as part of ethical socialism. Mm -hmm. You know, that you had a borough that was, um, had a huge child mortality rate, that was polluted and had no green space. And the Beautification Committee was that if at least, to your point, you could make people feel proud and have some sort of dignity. And, you know, so they grew flowers, they had bandstands, they had playgrounds, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It was amazing, but actually the whole point of it was to give people pride mm. in where they lived, you know, human dignity. So actually I think, you know, maybe style is a difficult word, mm. maybe beauty is a difficult word, but there is something about aesthetics mm -hmm. that I think we mustn't forget, mm -hmm. but it needs to be, you know, it, it needs to have integrity somehow. It can't just mm. be an afterthought, it's not a look. Mm. It's part of the package. And I, I would say to Peter's original point, you know, navigating that line with partners, mm. whatever, you know, the, 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 the money person, the manufacturing person or persons, you know, having that conversation where everyone can align on what is aesthetic for all of those people is one of the biggest challenges. Mm. And I think you, ha you, you have to have evidence, you have to have confidence, um, and you have to try and look forwards rather than looking back. In, in, that's my, my take on mm. it. And then you can have an, then you can put those things on the table and go, well, look, that's the package that I think is aesthetic and the reasons why. And then, then you can have a constructive conversation mm. around it. Otherwise, it's super subjective and everyone will just go, well, I like this thing, I yeah, like yeah. this thing, and what about that brand? And you also cannot separate aesthetics from politics and culture mm. because, you know, and, you know, everything else that's going on because it is all part of the same mindset, isn't it? 
if you look at the sort of so-called golden age in the Netherlands and, you know, Rembrandt, etc. I mean, those paintings, you know, he didn't just sit there going, this isn't a good look. <laughs> you know, it was part of a sort of political and social agenda of, you know, empowering the peoples, essentially. You know, they got rid of the Catholic Church and they were firmly in control of their cities themselves. And this was, you know, a statement about that. So I think everything is connected in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if, in a way, this, again, the sort of thinking about this in sort of in, his, in historical terms, whether the aesthetic aspect, which has been kind of connected to luxury, really, you know, like that good design is something which isn't available generally but needs to be paid for. So mm. if you want that level of attention and consideration given to an object, then you expect it to... But that says more about the power and the culture of the eras that we've lived through. Yeah. You know, so where it really got appropriated yeah. by commerce, yes, essentially. Yeah. And high consumerism, um, I think the eras that we're going into, yeah. you know, I think you've probably got better thoughts on it than I have, but I mean, you know, obviously the aesthetic is going to be driven by a much more diverse, mm. much more sustainable, you know, a completely different language. Mm. I mean, I, I think to, as we're talking about, you know, better future and, and, and what is good design, I think firstly, good design is accessible. Yeah, right. right? It should be accessible. Yeah. Um, whether you to a luxury, access it is. and you own it, or whether you access it and you rent it, but, but you have to be able to obviously invest in it, but that investment shouldn't be mm. significant for you to in, in enjoy it and for it to be of, of value. But I think one of the, one of the challenges is, you know, we've, you know, we've worked with, as you know, Elsa has, you know, what you might call luxury or, or premium brand. So if we're designing a, a, a speaker for, you know, Bang Olufsen or something like that, you know, they build it with a, an attention to detail and care mm. and materiality that suddenly makes the price point all the way up there. And on the face, you go, wow, that's su super expensive. Most people would say that's super expensive. But those products last, mm. we talked about, you know, timelessness and all that kind of thing, they last you know, forever if you take care of it. Mm. But I'm, I'm just, I don't know what the answer is, but how do you build that level of care and durability and attention into products which um, more people can afford? I think it comes down, obviously, to scale. I mean, you know, yeah. I think the IKEA mandate these days is around sustainability and affordability, but it's also around quality. And you can't maybe have quite as many sort of bells and whistles as yeah. what you've described. But I would say that their attention to detail in terms of the sourcing of their materials, the ethics yeah. that they are trying to embed in their... In, the, in, their, in their products. I mean, I don't think they would say that they're perfect, but they've definitely got the agenda, mm. and some of their things are perfect. Um, you know, I think it is possible, but it starts at the top, doesn't it? And I yeah. think you have to make a commitment to delivering... It's also a cultural, broader cultural... A good level of detail and quality. You know, what, what's, what, are, what, what are consumers' expectations? Because, on the one hand, if it's, as you say, if it's going to be of a very, very high quality, if it's going to last for years and years, mm. it's going to cost a bit more. Mm. And in some ways, it's also a requirement for, you know, on consumers to, to adapt to that. Mm. And second hand it, yeah. is great. I mean, I think the sure. fantastic development of the last few years has been, you know, the possibility of accessing really great second hand things online. Mm. So, you know, even if you don't manage to afford it the first time around, you can still access it. So I think that's going to be a it's really... Again, this is a question of newness, isn't it? Yeah. Whether or not the... There is an equation, though. Like, if yeah. I think about... So I'm constantly losing my headphones and, and or they just break for a mm. million different reasons. I reckon I've bought um, 10 pairs of, you know, fairly inexpensive headphones over a period of, like, two years. Mm. And maybe because I'm a bit careless or they've got magnets and they fall, fall off and that kind of thing. But actually, had I invested that same amount of money in a much better pair that I knew I could get... Um, uh, updated and repaired and that functionally maybe they were a bit better so they didn't fall um, short in the same way my other ones had and the brand had allowed me to buy in that small amount of money over time mm. that would be an equation yeah. which would, would, would solve yeah. that. Yeah, no, it's true. Mm. My husband's family is from Colombia and, you know, his mother basically says expensive is cheap. You know, we're too yeah. poor to buy cheap things. Yeah. And I think that's true, isn't it? And it's yeah. measured, actually. 
that one of the problems with not being able to buy better things, I mean, particularly when it comes to white goods, I believe, is that actually people are on a cycle of replacing because yeah. they're not repairable, they do break quickly. Whereas well, those it's designed for obsolescence as well, isn't yeah, it? It's baked exactly. in. Yeah. Whereas if you actually can afford to buy into a better level, you don't need to buy it again for a really long time. Mm. I'm wondering if there's, you know, just sort of building on that, whether there are, whether we could think about ways in which practice under current conditions um, can, can provide a kind of, maybe it can't bring about that change at a sort of, at a, at a general level, but it might be able to propose alternative ways of doing things. I mean, we learn by example, don't we? And, you know, as, as you were saying, Benjamin, I think earlier, you know, all of these companies doing really interesting things on a smaller scale mm. will change the center because, mm. you know, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And that's always been the yeah. case that the future starts on a small scale outside the center. I think what excites me about working with, with, with younger companies is that they are going to be the, the big change, change makers of tomorrow. Well, just inevitably, because they'll be alive. Well, <laughs> I well mean, there's that too. But I don't mean age. No, but I mean, it's relevant, you know. person's age, I mean, just in terms of mentality and, and age of business. And I think, you know, we obviously had the huge companies that are like tankers, and they, they, they change very, very slowly and change course. And you've got these, these small yeah, yeah. agile companies that are doing that right now, but the small agile companies will become the tankers, and then mm -hmm. that cycle repeats. And as designers, I think it's our responsibility to tap into and drive forward those new agendas in those, mm -hmm. in those smaller companies, as much Absolutely. as facilitating the larger, maybe even the larger paychecks. Mm. Absolutely. And I think that the larger companies need to work with those smaller ones yeah. and figure out how to become less sort of heavy. Yeah. Mm. Otherwise they can't move and be responsive. I think, you know, that historically the sort of commercial model has always been that companies just get bigger and bigger and taller and, and that has to stop. I yeah. mean, you have to have it more based on sort of bubbles that, you know, can adapt and adjust. And maybe the climate of today will, will, will actually facilitate some of that. You know, the, the risk of building a really big company at the moment, having loads of overheads, when something like COVID comes along, it's like, I need mm. to shed some of these overheads. So maybe yeah. it will facilitate that, that more nimble yeah. setup. Our commercial model of growth per se has to yeah. look at itself in a different way. I mean, it can't, it's not in and of itself sustainable. Yeah. Mm. I think that seems like a really good point to end. Thank you both for what was uh, an extremely engaging conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia.